Our Father, our Father, which art in heaven, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day. Give us this day. Our daily bread. Our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is a reading out of Psalms 90, uh, verse 1 and 2. Lord, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth. Before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world. Or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting. Even from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. Thou art God. Let the word, let the Lord have uh, a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll say... Praise the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Peace to everyone that's here, physical and spiritual Israel, as well as those that may be watching live or whenever this, uh, wherever this posts, YouTube or Facebook or wherever. Peace to you as well, and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. As always, it's a pleasure to be able to stand before you on the Lord's Sabbath day. Uh, thank and praise Him for His continual mercy. Thank you for giving me a safe passage from Vegas today to fellowship with my good friends here in Oakland. It's always, you know, a pleasure to see you guys and come fellowship. Today's lesson, I titled it Integrity, the Character of Abraham. Integrity, the Character of Abraham. And so what I tried to do with this lesson, and I hope it comes through okay, is, is I'm trying to show... We're trying to, I'm going to try to spend some time on Abraham, showing Abraham's character and uh, focusing on Abraham's integrity. And what I, what, I'm, what I hope to do with, or hope to accomplish with this lesson is that by looking at Abraham's character and looking at his, how he moved, that we can apply what we see in Abraham to our lives that we can apply the integrity that Abraham showed to our everyday dealings with, you know, whoever we come in contact, whether it be friends or family or whether it be uh, co-workers, whether it be uh, uh, co-students, you know, you're in school or wherever. Wherever we come in contact with people, I want us to be able to apply what we, what we learn from Abraham's character and from his integrity. So hopefully that, that comes through today. And uh, <clears throat> first thing I want to do is define integrity. The dictionary defines integrity as a firm adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values or incorruptibility or incapable of being bribed or morally corrupted, okay? That's a, that is a biblical, or a, a, a dictionary, a dictionary a definition of integrity. Now in the Bible, in the, the Hebrew word translated integrity, in the Old Testament means the condition of being without blemish, completeness, imperfection, or um, I'm sorry, perfection, sincerity, soundness, uprightness and wholeness that's what that's what the bible that's what the interpreted word for integrity shows that's what it means okay i'll read that again it it shows without blemish completeness perfection sincerity soundness uprightness and wholeness the new testament means honesty and adherence to a pattern of good works okay that's that's what we're going to see 
integrity being in the New Testament. We're going to go right away. Let's go to Titus 2. We're going to go to Titus 2. I'm going to pick it up at verses 6 and 7. Titus 2. <clears throat> Verses 6 and 7. <coughs> All right, Titus 2. Verses 6 and 7, when you get it, my brother, go ahead and read. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded mm -hmm. in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Right, so when he says in all things, not just some things, right? He said in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. So no matter what's going on around you, no matter what the situation is, we're supposed to maintain and show integrity. We're supposed to maintain our dignity, right? In all things, not just some things. I don't care if a brother walks up and slaps you in the face. <laughs> You're supposed to maintain your integrity, right? Now, that's a hard thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> I, I, you ain't gonna hear me say it's easy as a matter of fact you ain't gonna hear me say that I, I, I've done that <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay I'm just saying well, the books say you're supposed to maintain your integrity in all things show a good a pattern of good works he said show a pattern of good works he said he says uh, uh, in doctrine Showing uncorruptness, showing uncorruptness, right? Gravity, that means you stay, you, you, you know, you keep your, your head on your shoulders, being well-centered. Keep your head on your shoulders and sincerity. Be sincere about it, you know, and, 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 you know it, take your integrity seriously. Job took, you know, Job is a good example. He took his integrity seriously. He wouldn't, he wouldn't bad mouth or, or sin against the Lord for nothing. Verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. You understand? Israel had a problem with this. Well, I mean, I don't want to just put it on Israel, but I, I, I'm around Israel a lot, and I, have, I hear Israel struggle with this. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. Now, that didn't, it doesn't say what we, you know, words that we think or may, may not think that are, or, uh, I'm using the word profane. It doesn't matter if, if Simeon thinks it's profane and I don't, or vice versa. He says strong words that cannot be condemned. So it doesn't matter what it is. Stay away from words that, that, that society deems as unfit. There's certain words, like, there's certain mild, I want to say mild, profane words, like the S word. Some people feel like it's okay to say the S word. And I say, well, you might feel like that, but will you allow your kids or can your kids go to school and use words like that? Would you stand before Jesus and use that word and feel comfortable using it? So if you if you can not honestly say, well, yeah, I let my kids go to school and say that. Or, yeah, I stand in for it before Jesus and say that. Then I say that's probably a word you need to stay away from. You understand what I'm saying? Integrity. It's just about integrity. Go ahead. That he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, mm -hmm. having no evil thing to say of you. See, that he that of a contrary part, so somebody who is not uh, maintaining their integrity, is someone who is not living the, living the truth, when they look at you and they see different from you, they, can't, they have to be ashamed of themselves. That's the way, man, I smacked him in the mouth and he didn't, you know, he didn't do nothing about it. He maintained his integrity. I couldn't make that man of God mad. I'm ashamed of myself. You see what I'm saying? That's that's the that is the character that we want to exude. That's the person we ought to strive to be. Now, Jesus is the perfect example of a man of integrity. Now, we all profess to be Christians, right? That means we're supposed to be Christ like. So Jesus 
is our example of a perfect man of an integrity. After he was baptized, he went into the wilderness. He, he was tempted of Satan 40 days and nights. And during that time that Satan tempted him, he was at his weakest. Jesus was at his weakest when he was being tempted. But yet, but yet, he still maintained his integrity. He still maintained his integrity. Now, Jesus, we know he was at this time that he's being tempted. He's he was holy man. He was he was all human. At the same time, he was holy God. So he said, well, he might had an, he might have had an advantage. Jesus might have had an advantage, whereas us simple human beings, we didn't. Well, that's not necessarily so. Let's let's flip over to Hebrews four. Let's flip, let's flip over to Hebrews four. So we don't we don't have a God that can't understand our plight. We have a God that can understand what it is that we go through. And though Jesus was holy God, he was holy man at the same time. He went through the same things and was tempted every way that we were. Hebrews four, <coughs> pick it up at verse 15, four and 15. Go ahead. For if we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. So we have we have a high priest. We have a God that can he, that he is he can feel what we feel. He knows what we've gone through. He knows what we go through. Go ahead. But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He was in all points tempted yet as we are, just like we are. But yet he maintained his integrity. Right. He maintained living and being tempted and not sinning. Now, do you think about that? Now, we're supposed to be godlike. We're supposed to be Christ like. So that don't leave very much room when we're going through the stuff for us, for, for us to allow our integrity to be damaged, does it? Don't leave very much room, does it? We don't have very much excuse when we're going through the thing, when we're going through all the stuff for us to say, well, you know, I got mad and, you know, and I, I, pun I punched my wife in the throat. You, you can't do that. <laughs> you, you, got to, you got to say, you got to maintain, you got to say, look, I'm trying to be Christ-like. He, he, he went to the point of death and maintained his integrity and did not sin. We, like Paul tell you, I ain't mean, even be in this same chapter. Uh, I mean, we haven't even we haven't even resisted up to blood yet. We haven't even resisted up to blood. But yet we'll lose our cool sometimes. So we can't do that, brothers and sisters. We got to learn to keep maintain our integrity. We got to learn to maintain the character, that moral character that God has instilled in us once we became baptized. OK. Uh, Jesus being absolutely the definition of integrity. He's the only one who was ever without blemish. He's the only, he was the only one we can absolutely say without a doubt was perfect from beginning to end uh, and completely truthful always, showing a pattern of integrity and perfection, a good works. A simple human being that we are, uh, our integrity is flawed. But Jesus' integrity was perfect. When we are in Christ, like, you know, you, you hear a lot of the, the Sunday Christians use that term. And it's not bad, but they say, well, you know, once I got in Christ or I'm in Christ or things, you know, that such and such. But, but be, since we are in Christ and we are partake of his, we partake of his divine nature, you might say. Being in Christ or being in this walk, we're supposed to partake in his divine nature and having been given uh, once you get baptized, having been given the gift of the Holy Ghost, we now should have Christ's nature and we should also uh, show and exhibit that nature. And I'm, what do I mean by that? Go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. And verse 17. Second Corinthians five and verse 
17. All right, go ahead. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So if any man be in Christ, if any man claims to be walking this walk in the truth, he is a, a new creature. He has become a new creature. And what? Old things are passed away. Uh-huh. Behold, all things are become new. Old things are passed away. That means you don't walk like you used to. You don't make the same moves as you used to. Right? Right. So now all things have become new. You're doing a whole lot of whole new, a whole lot of different things now. You're making different choices. You're making different decisions. When things get bad, you know how to handle it better. Or you maybe you, you learn from your experiences and you learn how to handle these situations better. Okay? That's what that's what it that's what it means to be given a new a new nature. You have a new nature. You should be you you your, your instincts should be different now. Your, diff, your instincts should be different now. So when next time the man comes in and wants to slap you in the face, you say, you know, you, you're, more, you're prepared for it and you know how to handle it. Maybe you pray for the brother this time instead of socking him back. You see what I'm saying? We think and we move different. Okay. Now the Bible also describes integrity as the truth. It, it describes integrity as the truth. And what is the truth? Well, Jesus is the truth. Jesus was the truth. Let's go to John 14. John 14. Jesus tell you he is the truth. As a matter of fact, he is the only way to eternal life. John 14, pick it up at verse 6. John 14 and verse 6. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Mm -hmm. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No, he said, I am the way. He said, the truth. So Jesus is the truth and the life. He's the only way to salvation. He's the only way to the Father. He's the only way to eternal life. Jesus, and we just defined the show, Jesus is a perfect example of integrity, right? He's a perfect example of integrity. In the Bible here, in this verse, we're showing that integrity is also defined as the truth. And Jesus is the only real truth. He's the only, he's the only real uh, gospel, the only real word out there, you might want to, I want to say. And... Uh, And the only way to eternal life. Now, many times you hear Jesus, uh, you know, when he's talking, he'll say, uh, truly, truly. Well, you know, it's truly, truly, I, uh, or, you know, verily, verily, I say unto you, you know, he, he starts out a lot of times like that. And essentially what he's saying is, I tell you the truth, you know, da, 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 whatever he's getting ready to say. So he clearly makes that point and he never lied. Jesus never told a lie. Obviously, he never sinned. He never told a lie. His actions defined integrity. His actions defined integrity. Everything he did showed he showed his integrity. That's that's the one thing you know. I try to I try to maintain myself about myself wherever I'm at. If it's you know, especially at work, when people are you know that I know that are not walking the truth, they're looking at me. I want them to say, I, you know that you know Travis has got integrity. No matter what's going on, he's always going to find a way to do the right thing. And I want people to see that. It's like I've said many a time, I shouldn't have to go around telling people that I'm a Christian. They should be able to see that in my actions. They should be able to see, they should be able to see that in everything I do in my daily walk, that that guy is a man of God. That's, that's, that's how I want people to view me. I want them to see my integrity. And once we come into Christ, in faith and rep uh, repentance, he gives us the Holy Spirit that's supposed to help us to walk in our integrity. It's supposed to help uh, and develop our incorruptibleness. It is impossible to have real integrity without Jesus in your life. It's impossible. You got to have God to have integrity. I mean, there, there's, there's people that can, 
you know, there's, there's, there are some decent people out there that, that aren't walking in this word. I'm going to say that. There are some decent people out there. But, but if they don't have Christ, they're, they're, their, their integrity is, is, is subject to being damaged much more easy than someone that's walking in this truth. Someone that's walking is going to be a hot, lot harder to get out of it uh, or to be uh, swayed to do something out of character than anybody else. I'm going to put it like that. All right, so now I want to get into, so I've talked about integrity, um, you know, the definition and, and kind of showing you kind of the, the, road, the road that I want to pay attention to uh, with Abraham. Let's get into Abraham a little bit, okay? Uh, so despite some, what it, well, I don't, I don't, how I want to say this? Abraham, I don't think that we look sometimes in depth at Abraham. Abraham did have some what you might call shortcomings as a husband uh, and a father. But his obedience was spot, his obedience to God was spot on. His obedience was spot on. His faith was spot on. His hospitality uh, and his ability, ability to intercede on the behalf of others was spot on. Absolutely exemplary. But he did have a few weaknesses. And we're going to read and we're going to see that. We're going to examine some of the weaknesses that Abraham had. But even with those, with those weaknesses, he managed to maintain his integrity. Okay? Now, again, we can have some weaknesses. There are things that get to every, each and every one of us. There's, like my wife knows exactly which buttons to push on me. She knows all those pressure points. But even in those weaknesses, in my weaknesses... I got to know how to maintain my integrity, right? So whenever somebody's pushing you, you got to know how to maintain your integrity, okay? Now, Abraham, it said that Abraham was a friend of God in the scriptures, right? Abraham is considered a friend of God. He was blessed by God. So let's go to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. And we're going to read verses 18. And 19. <clears throat> Genesis 14, verses 18 and 19. All right, go ahead. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. All right, so Abraham, we can see, we, we know who this, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, is, right? That's Jesus, right? He said he, he brought forth bread and wine, and he says he blessed him. That him is Abraham. Abram, he blessed him. And, and, and it said, blessed be Abram, the most high of the of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. All right. So Abram was blessed by God. Let's go to Genesis. Flip over to Genesis 21. Genesis 21. One verse here, verse 22, 21 and verse 22. We're just looking at a few verses here. We're going to look at Abraham, how God has blessed Abraham. All right, go ahead. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Pharaoh, the chief captain of, the, of his host, spake unto Abram, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. In just some things. In all that thou doest. God was with Abraham in all that he did. All that he did. Okay, not just some things, in all that he did. Okay, uh, Genesis 24 and verse 1. Genesis 24 and verse 1. I'm just showing how God was with Abraham, how God blessed Abraham. Go ahead. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. Mm -hmm. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. In all things. He got, when he, even when he was old and well stricken in age, he said, the Lord was with him and blessed him in all things. Gen uh, 
Skip down to uh, verse 35. Skip down to 35. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. So the Lord blessed Abraham with all these things, all these things. But what do you think it took for Abraham to get that? He had to maintain his in integrity throughout. He had to maintain his integrity throughout. He had, to, he had to show his faith and he had to be complete in his walk. He had to be complete in his walk. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, if we can do the same thing, we can, we can amass that substance, we can amass that prosperity that Abraham amassed. Okay? Abraham worshiped God. Let's get back to uh, 21, chapter 21, in verse 33. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called thereon the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So Abraham did, did dedicated a special place where he could go and call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? So I'm, I'm just showing how Abraham worshipped God. Uh, skip back to chapter 12. And pick it up at verse 8, 12 and 8. We're gonna be flipping around a lot. I got a lot of scripts too. I did. I, I did. I didn't. I, I was rushing, and I didn't feel like going back and cutting anything. So y'all getting the full brunt of <laughs> you getting the full force today. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ch uh, chapter twelve, verse eight. Go ahead. And removed from thence unto the mountain on the east of Bethel, mm -hmm. and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. Mm -hmm. And there he built an altar unto the Lord. And called upon the name of the Lord. So he was serious about worshiping his God, wasn't he? I mean, he was building groves, built an altar. He was serious about this. Uh, skip down to verse, uh, no, that's 12. Go into chapter 13 and verse 4. Chapter 13 and verse 4, go ahead. Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Skip down to verse 18. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So he, he, he's all the time building, building a spot or carving out a spot or somewhere where he could go and call on the Lord. He did this without fail multiple times. OK, he shows he has faith in God going to chapter 15. One verse here, verse six. Chapter 15 and verse 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham showed he had faith. He believed in the Lord and the Lord counted that towards to him as righteousness. The Lord counted that to him as righteousness. If we are faithful like that, we show up every Sabbath day, you know, not forsaking the holy convocation. We we show up on the feast days. We're keeping, keeping our feast days, like Brother Simeon and I were talking just earlier, trying to doing our best to keep the feast days clean, keep it holy. You know, a lot of people don't focus on that. They just focus on the eating and the drinking part of it. But if we're in our minds, we got the right mindset and we're trying to, you know, do what the day was meant to remind us of the future things to come, the shadow of things to come, and to keep the day holy and keep our, our worship clean and holy and righteous, then the Lord will count that to us as righteousness. It's all about maintaining, again, integrity. Abraham did this. Uh, Romans, uh, Romans 4. Romans 4, going, verses 18 through 22. Romans 4, verses 18 through 
22. Who against hope <laughs> believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. Now we're talking about Abraham here. Go ahead. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Mm -hmm. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. So even though the Lord told him something was going to happen that was quite unbelievable, it, especially in our, our time, it's, I mean, that's somebody tell me, I even, even somebody above the age of 60 talking about having a child. I, I, you know, that's, that's kind of shocking to me. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's rare. It's very rare still yet in this day. But Abraham being above eight, being above or 100 years of age, and then the Lord telling him this, he didn't, he didn't waver a bit. He didn't have unbelief. He didn't have unbelief. He said the Lord can accomplish this. And he, he believed. Where yet? 21. Go ahead. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Uh huh. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. So again, it was imputed to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted, counted it to him as righteousness. He believed in the Lord, counted to him as righteousness. Uh, jump over to Hebrews 6. Verse 15, Hebrews 6 and verse 15. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and hath an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. All right, where, where are we at? That's 15, right? Yes. Okay. All right. And so the verse I wanted 15. And so he at and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained his promise. So it took it took Abraham going through some things for a while before he attained the promise. But he maintained his faith. So I, the, the thing, the, the key point I want to point out here is that sometimes things don't always happen when we think it should or in the time frame that we should it should. <laughs> that we hope it to happen. But if we maintain our integrity, the Lord will deliver on time. It may not happen in time, but it's always on time. Or maybe it's, uh, maybe I should say that the other way. It may not happen on time, but it's just in time. Let me put it that way. Okay? The Lord will deliver. But we got to maintain throughout. Uh, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 we're going 8 through 12. 8 through 12, and then we're going to skip down to verse 17 through 19. So Hebrews 11, verse 8, 8 through 12. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. Mm-hmm. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, mm -hmm. dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now imagine, you know, we're, we are told by the Lord, I want you to leave the comfort of your, your, your country, your father's house. I want you to leave that comfort, and I want you to go out there into the land with your family <laughs> And you're just going to go where I tell you to go. Imagine how much, how much faith that take, right? That take a lot of faith. But Abraham did it. Abraham did that. He did that with his kids. He took all his substance. And he traveled, you know, moving from place to place based upon what the Lord said and, and, and take, just to take care of business. But Abraham did this. Go ahead. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Uh-huh. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Uh -huh. Therefore sprang there even of one 
and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Uh huh. So this, these, these are, these are the character. This is this shows the character of Abraham, his integrity, his faith, his obedience, his willingness to listen to the word of God. Skip down to verse 17 and go ahead. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Mm -hmm. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Uh -huh. So now I don't even have to say, <laughs> I mean, I can't, we can't even imagine being asked to do something like that. But Abraham, willing to listen to God, having that unmovable faith, was willing to do what the Lord asked of him and demonstrated his faith. But go ahead. Where you at? 18. Go ahead. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall I see be called, uh -huh. accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So it's, it's easy to, you know, it's easy to see Abra how Abraham could have this kind of faith when you realize, you know, Abraham knew if he did, if he, if he sacrificed Isaac, the Lord would be able to raise him up another son or to raise him from the dead or whatever his plan. He knew and all he had to do was trust in the Lord. That's all he that's all he knew. All I got to do is trust in the Lord. And I'm sure this will turn out all right. Mm -hmm. And that's what we got to apply to our lives and whatever it is we're going through. Whatever happens bad, I just know I got to trust in the Lord and it's going to. It's, it's supposed to work out to the good for, or for the good to those who love him. That's what the scripture tells us. We got to have faith in that. Was that 19? Yes. All right. Now let's look at his obedience. Genesis, let's go back to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. And we're going to read... 1 through 19, Genesis 22, 1 through 19. All right, my brother, go ahead and read. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Uh -huh. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Wait a minute. He didn't say, what, what, did I hear you correctly, Lord? Did you, you, what did you say? <laughs> he didn't question him at all? No. Nah, nah. You think that was missing in there? You think Moses neglected to put that somewhere? No. Nah. I mean, there wasn't even a pause. God, I want you to go. I want you to go into a land I'm going to tell you there and offer up, you know, your son. And the next morning, Abraham rose up early. It wasn't no pause in that. I mean, that's faith. That's faith. Go ahead and start from the top of three again. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and his son and Isaac, his son. Mm hmm and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Mm -hmm. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Go ahead. And Abraham said unto his young, his young men, abide, he, abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, I always wonder about this. D Abraham could have been thinking ahead. I don't know because it don't say, but I always wonder about this. Abraham could have been thinking ahead a little bit. You know, he, he brought these two young men. He knows what he's supposed to go up there to do. Now, these two young men may not see it the same way. You about to sacrifice your son? They might have interfered with God's plan, right? right? So Abraham, knowing, having faith, again, I can't read it, but I can only imagine him thinking, I can't have nothing interfere with God's plan on this. These two young men might not understand. So he's thinking ahead. He's doing, he's saying, I'm going to do everything in my power to do what thus saith the Lord. 
And see, this is what I'm talking about when we got to try to understand how to apply things to our life. We got to be thinking ahead sometimes. Is, is my going over to Big Mama's house on Christmas Day going to interfere with my ability to maintain my integrity? Maybe I don't go on Christmas Day. Maybe I go the day after or the day before. Maybe I don't even go that week. Thinking ahead, you see what I'm saying? I'm going to do whatever it takes at all cost to keep the commandment of the Lord. That's what we got to be thinking, running through our head at all times. Again, I don't know that's the reason why he left these two behind, but it shows thought. It, th it shows there's some thought here. Go ahead. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. Mm -hmm. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father... And he said, here, I, here am I, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, Isaac, <laughs> he started to wonder a little bit. I know we're here to make a sacrifice because this, you know, this is not something uncommon with Abraham. I'm sure Isaac has done this, you know, this procedure many a times. We see, we saw, you know, Leading up to this, that Abraham, he went, he, he went, he made groves. He did, he made altars. He built altars to show his worship to the Lord. And I'm sure, I'm sure, just like any good father would do, would teach his son these practices, how to worship the Lord. So Isaac has probably seen this altar building, this, this, uh, you know, this procedure for sacrifice done many a time. And he don't, he don't see no, no rams, no lambs, no turtle doves, nothing around. He's starting to wonder, who, what is going on this fire? <laughs> what is getting on this fire? But where is the lamb for burnt offering, he said. Verse 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. Uh -huh. So they went, both of them together. Right, go ahead. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abram built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Uh -huh. And Abram stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Go ahead. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Mm -hmm. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son thine only son from me. All right. So now we see Abraham, he was going to go through. He was going to do it because he had faith. He was convicted that the Lord knew what he was doing. Even though the Lord is showing here, he said, hey, I don't even know where your heart's at, where your mind's at, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to, I'm going to see what you're going to decide. I'm going to see which way you turn. We're going to know today if you will serve me or no. And Abraham showed that faith clear up to the time where that angel had to say, hey, stop. Don't lay your hand on the lad. Okay. We have verse uh, 13. 13. Go ahead. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horn. And I know Moses must exclude the part where he said, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and Abraham what? And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Uh-huh. And, and Isaac, I'm sure, had to jump up off there. Mad as a, horn, mad as a hornet. <laughs> mad as a wet hen. What you mean you was getting ready to sacrifice me? <laughs> I, I kid a little bit, but I don't know if I could have took all that. <laughs> But see, you know, that's what it means, though. You got to maintain your integrity. Uh, Isaac's showing a little integrity because we didn't see no foul, no foul language come out of this or nothing. So I have to believe even Isaac learned from his father and maintained his integrity. Where you at, 15? 14. 14, go ahead. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, mm -hmm. as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord shall it be seen. Go ahead. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham out of heaven the second time, uh -huh. and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply 
by sea as the stars of the heaven mm -hmm. and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. So you see, because Abraham maintained his integrity, what did the Lord do for him? He blessed him, didn't he? He blessed him. And I, I always look, in, you know, in, in the things that I go through, I always look after I know that I have been tested and I know that I've been tempted. And if I was able to overcome that test or this temptation with flying colors, I look for a blessing. I honestly, I look later or short time after that for a blessing because I expect, I, can, I feel like I can expect the Lord to keep his word and bless me for overcoming those temptations. And honestly, I have seen those blessings after I have overcome. If I didn't falter, if I didn't waver going through it, I have seen those blessings. You can count on it. You can, like, I, I, you know, my elders my, uh, grow, growing up, my uncles used to always say, just going to church, you can expect a blessing. And they all believe that. Just go to church and you can expect a blessing. And I always look in my head thinking that. Boy, I'm just going to church today. I'm going to receive my blessing. If I don't do nothing else, I'll go to church just to get the blessing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that was on my mind as a kid. So overcoming these temptations, overcoming that, those trials, you can you can look for a blessing from the, from the Lord, but you got to come through it. You got to maintain your integrity. You can't waver. Where you at, my brother? Eighteen. Go ahead. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Uh huh. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Very very good. All right. So let's keep going. Uh. Go back to chapter 12 and verse 4. Chapter 12 and verse 4. Again, we're showing how Abraham was obedient. One verse, verse 4, go ahead. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. So Abraham was 70 and five years old. You know what? Skip, skip back up. We ain't got, I ain't got nothing else to do. Might as well, might as well be reading here. Uh, go back. Just start at verse 1 so, so, they, so we know what's going on here. Go ahead. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Mm -hmm. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee. And make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Uh huh. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So, verse 4, go ahead. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. Right, so the Lord told Abraham, get, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred's house. And I'm going to bless thee. And Abraham was obedient. He took Ab Abraham, uh, uh, took uh, Sarah, his wife. He took Lot, his, his brother's son. And they, you know, they, 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 they lit out. They lit out. All on the Lord say so. Genesis 26. Genesis 26. Pick it up at verse 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philippines, unto Gerar. Uh -huh. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall dwell, I shall tell thee of. Okay, so big time famine in the land. And the Lord told Abraham, he said, look, don't, don't go down into G don't, blah, blah, blah. don't go down into Egypt. I want you to maintain, stay right here in this land that I tell thee of. Now, uh, later on, we see Egypt, uh, you know, when they go through a famine like this again, Egypt is the place to go because that's where all the grain was at. But the Lord was telling Abraham, he said, no, don't go down in Egypt. Don't go down there. Now, again, this this has got to, you know, make Abraham say in his mind, OK, I know the food's going to be down there, Lord, but you're telling me to stay here. I'm going to listen to you. 
again, that's a, you know, it, it wants to, in your mind, you'd want to, you, you'd be at odds. You know what I mean? It'd be a controversy in your head. It'd be a war. Should I go where I know the food's at or should I stay here and wait and, and patiently wait on the Lord? <coughs> skip, <coughs> excuse me, skip down to verse uh, five. Skip down to verse five and go ahead. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. Okay, so Abraham obeyed his voice. He did. It didn't matter what he might have thought about this idea, staying here versus the famine. It didn't matter. Abraham obeyed the Lord's voice, and he kept his charge, his commandments, his statutes, and his laws. That's the kind of dude, that's the kind of character that Abraham had. That's the kind of character that we need to have. Going to James 2. James 2, we're going to uh, verses 20 through 22. James 2, 20 through 22. All right, go ahead. But what thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. You can say you have faith all, the, all day long, but if you ain't got nothing to show, that you have faith, what's that mean? Those are vain words, aren't they? Right? I tell people all day long, yeah, I, I can climb to the top of that ladder that's, you know, a hundred feet off the ground. I tell them that all day long, but ain't nobody gonna believe it until I prove it. Then, and I, you know, I'm not saying I'm scared of heights because I'm, I'm funny about it. I'm not really scared of heights because I can stand on the top of the mountain and look down and be okay. But if, there, but if there's a sharp a drop at the edge, I, I'm not so willing just to get up close to that. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you just can't. I'm just not going to walk up over the top of it and just look down like that. There got to be some kind of way I know I'm protected. And you couldn't, ain't no way you could even push me off to do no bungee jump or something like that. You can't. I, there's no way I'm going by myself. Somebody is going down with my hands wrapped around their throat, but we going together. Because <laughs> that's the only way he got me off of there. I promise you that. No, I couldn't jump out of no airplane, no helicopter, nothing like that. I, no. But I wouldn't, I'm not afraid to be up there, though. Uh, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith that thou works is dead? Go ahead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? So it wasn't, he, the Lord knew he had faith, but he wasn't justified until he was getting ready to go through the motions, right? He wasn't justified until he actually showed it. He had to have those works behind it. Verse 21, uh, uh, 22, right? Yeah. yeah, 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was um, faith made perfect. So his faith was made perfect with his works attached to that. Now, I, like I said, I can say all day long, I can climb that top of the ladder. Now, those words aren't actually perfect. They are made perfect until I go through the action, until I got works behind that. So we need to have some works with our faith. We got to have the, the works with it. All right. Uh, Go back to Genesis 20. We're going to be, in, if you didn't already figure that out, we're going to be in Genesis a lot. Keep your marker. Genesis 20. And we're going to verse 7. Genesis 20 and verse 7. Now I want to look at another characteristic of Abraham, which was that he was a prophet and by proxy, an intercessor for others. He was a prophet and by proxy, an intercessor for others. Genesis 20 and verse 7. Go ahead. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. Mm -hmm. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. Mm -hmm. Thou and all that are thine. Okay, so now we see that Abraham, if you didn't know Abraham was a prophet, he was like, like I said, he was also an intercessor because he says, and he shall pray for thee. 
He, he shall pray for you. So Abraham was a prophet, an intercessor, and, thou, and, and if Abraham prayed for you, he said, thou shalt live. Thou shalt live. Now, I always wondered, he said, because in the, part, the other part of this, and thou shalt, and, and if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. And we're going to read, we're going to read the uh, particulars of this, but just to, you know, just to uh, touch on it a little bit, Abraham's wife had been taken this time, this was by Abimelech, so Abraham's wife is taken by being like he didn't know he was his sister. So I wondered, I always wondered if the Lord was going to do this killing or if it was going to be Abraham. Because we know what Proverbs tell you, a man, a jealous man, that's his rage. And he's not going to pardon. And you take his wife or you, you know, you sleep with his wife. So I always wonder, is that is that rage? Is that Abraham's rage that's going to do all this killing? Or is the Lord going to take care of this business? Because I know if it was me, I, I, you know, look, Lord, you ain't got I, I got it. <laughs> I, I, I take care of all that. Yeah. <laughs> and the other one, he telling me, uh, I think, he, is it here? Let me see. He said, I'm gonna kill, I'll kill you and all your family. I think it's in the other, in the other, no, we're gonna read. Uh, uh, go to uh, 18, chapter 18. Chapter 18, pick it up at verse 16. Eighteen and here, uh, eighteen verse sixteen. We're going sixteen through thirty-three, and I want you to see what what I'm trying to show you here. Remember, I said God, a Abraham was a is a prophet and an intercessor. Let's see how he's interceding here. Okay, he's interceding for some for other righteous people on their behalf. Go ahead. And the man rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with him to bring them on the way. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Uh -huh. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become great, become a great and mighty nation, mm -hmm. and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Uh -huh. Now, remember in, uh, oh man, I think, it's, I think it's Hosea, I can't remember off the top of my head, but the Lord says, surely I will reveal everything to my prophets, right? He said, I'll reveal everything. Before I do anything, I'm going to reveal it to my prophets, right? What's the Lord here showing you? He said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing to which I do? No, he's not going to hide. He's going to reveal to Abraham exactly what he's about to do. Giving credence again that Abraham was a true prophet. Go ahead. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord mm -hmm. to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because her sin is very grievous, mm -hmm. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, mm -hmm. which is, come unto me, and if not, I will know. So, 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 the, uh, so the report of some Sodom and Gomorrah has, has made it circuit around to the Lord, and the Lord said, oh, you know what? I got to go down there for myself and see what I heard is true. I can't even believe that. I got to go down there and see for myself. And he said, I, if, if the cry is what I heard is true, then I will know. Go ahead. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Uh -huh. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Okay, so Abraham's standing there with the Lord. And now he's going he's gonna to play the intercessor role. Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Is the Abraham, the Abraham doesn't want the wicked or the, the righteous to be destroyed here, which, which a good intercessor would do, to intercede upon his, his, his uh, fellow servants, his fellow saints, right? Go ahead. Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Mm -hmm. Will thou also destroy, not, destroy and not spare the place for 50 righteous that are therein? Uh-huh. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, uh -huh. and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Right, so Abraham is asking, and, he, and, and I always felt through this, this passage, Abraham was a little bit bold. <laughs> he's, he's a little bit bold, but he understands, 
his relationship with the Lord. He understands. He knows what his faith is. And he's not talking to the Lord out of ignorance. He's talking to him through through some knowledge and through wisdom. And pay attention to this. What I want you to get uh, understand here. <coughs> he's with the though he's talking to the Lord. He is also now we know, of course, uh, there we do not have to remind God about the word of God. He wrote the word of God. He knows the scriptures. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you're making a for instance, when you're making a prayer, or you're making a petition of the Lord. Remind the do like Abraham did. Do like Moses did. Remind the Lord of the words that he used. It shows it shows your faith. It shows your works at, at reading and understanding his word. You see what I'm saying? You show the Lord, say, hey, Lord, I know you have said in your word that if I do this ABC, then you will bless me with this X, Y, Z. Remind the Lord of, the, of his words when you're talking. This is what Abraham is doing. He says, and the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee. That would be far from me. He said, don't, don't, you're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. That's far from your character, Lord. That's not how you operate, right? He said, he said, uh, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Shall not the God of all the earth do right? He's reminded, he's, he's mentioning, not that he asked question of the Lord, but he's saying, look, Lord, I know this is your character. I know this is your word, right? I know, Lord, if I continue to be faithful and I go to the, and I keep the Sabbath like I'm supposed to, I, I'm diligent about eating clean. I'm diligent about uh, keeping your feast days. I know that you will bless me and my family. I know that you'll keep me safe when I travel. I know that you'll keep my children safe when they're in school. You see what I'm saying? You see how that how we can apply these things to our life? Where are you at? Verse uh, 26. 26. Go ahead. And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. And you see the Lord's response? He said, you're exactly right, Abraham. If I find 50, then I will spare them for that. You know, I will spare them because he know he's a man of his word. He's a God of truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. He never lied. He would not lie. His word cannot come back void. It cannot. Go ahead. Verse 28. And Abraham answered and said, behold, now I've taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Uh huh. Peradventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou, wilt thou destroy all the city for the lack of five? Mm -hmm. And he said, if I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. Go ahead. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty sake. Uh huh. Keep going. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there should be 30 found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Uh huh. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there should be 20 found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 20 sake. Uh huh. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. <laughs> oh, Lord, don't be angry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and I will speak yet, but this once, Peradventure 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10 sake. Uh huh. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Okay. So even though the Lord, even though it looks like Abraham is being bold here, what he is showing is his persistence in his prayer. He's showing persistence in his in, in his uh, responsibility to intercede on on behalf of others, and we got to show that same persistence. We got we 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 want something we. If we require the hand of the Lord to intervene or intercede on our behalf in some in some uh, uh, position or, or circumstance in life, you got to be persistent. You need to have Abraham's persistence. Now, again, not, you know, don't be disrespectful at all, but be bold. Go before the Lord boldly and, and, and let the Lord know I'm going to keep petitioning and I'm going to petition you until you know, I get an answer one way or the other, one way or the other, but be persistent about it. But at the same time, remember, you got to maintain your integrity. You got to maintain your integrity. 
Um, um, did we read James 2 and 23? I don't remember. Okay, so we touched on that. I was going to sort of point out again, James, uh, he, was a, he was definitely a friend of God. Um, yeah, we've already touched that. Um, Oh yeah, these are. I did want to include these. So let, uh, I guess go to Second Chronicles twenty. Second Chronicles twenty. I forgot. I went. I meant to when I added Chronicles. these. Chronicles. I meant to move them up in the list. Then I forgot to go back and actually move them up in my notes. First, uh, Second Chronicles twenty, verse seven. This is uh, again. Abraham, James, in, in James, he said Abraham was a friend to God. Again, this is uh, backing that up. Second Chronicles 20, verse 7. I like you, I like you have all the scripts. Put them all in your, in your, uh, in your war chest. <laughs> Second Chronicles 20, verse 7. Go ahead. Are not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel? And gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever. Thy mm, my, my friend forever. See, and it was no, no uh, secret. Ab everybody knew Abraham. God called him, counted him a friend. Uh, Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, verse 8. Isaiah 41. And verse 8. All right, brother, go ahead. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. The Lord saying right out of his mouth, through the mouth of Isaac, he's saying, Abraham, my friend. Right? Okay. Um, now let's go to, let's go back to Genesis 12. And we're going to now look at, remember when I started out, I said that we were going to look at Abraham's character. We were going to see even some of his weaknesses, right? We're going to try to see some of Abraham's weaknesses. And uh, I saw an article, I read an article was talking about uh, Abraham. And they were saying, I don't know how they put it. They, they were saying that Abraham was a coward, he showed a coward a character a characteristic of a coward and they and they used this and i see why they say that but i think using the word coward might be kind of strong language might be kind of strong language so let's read this and i'll let, i'll allow you to form your own terminology or ver verbiology for this okay genesis 12 and pick it up at verse 10 12 and start at verse 10 when you get it, brother, go ahead. And there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down into Egypt and sojourned there. For the famine was grievous in the land. Uh -huh. And it came to pass, and he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Uh -huh. So Abraham, they're getting ready to go down into Egypt. And, the, and, and Sarah says to his wife, Behold, look, he said, I know that you are a fair woman. He said, behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. He said, he's going to tell, I want you to tell him, you know, that you're my sister. Don't tell him you're my wife, because they, probably, they will probably kill me. Go ahead. Therefore, it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, 
this is his wife, mm -hmm. and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. So I want you to go tell them you're my sister, so they will they won't kill me, right? Now as I say again, the article I was reading that was the, that was debating this was saying that this was a cowardly act by Abraham. Okay, and there's you know several ways to view this. I mean, you can look at it as a cowardly act. You could look at it as shrewd thinking because he didn't tell a lie. She was his sister, and she's also his wife. Yeah, so it's not, he wasn't necessarily lying. He was just using a different way of getting through Egypt without having any issues <coughs> or any problems here. He's trying to deal with this, deal with the problem in a way that would cause him less uh, static. So he thought, wow. at least so he thought, right? So... I don't necessarily say it's a cowardly way of doing it because, you know, some, some, some of these super Hebrews would be like, no, man, you should go up and stand up to Pharaoh and tell him, no, this is my wife and you can't have her and you got to come through me to get her, right? I mean, that's, that's a bold way of doing it. But that's also a good way to get your head chopped off without any discussion. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I've, heard this. I've heard this before. Right. I've not heard, I heard it was more like he had a lack of, he had a lack of faith. So it could be showing lack of faith. I mean, some said that showing lack of faith, but it wasn't. I mean, this is not like the Lord was telling him or testing him. I want you to go down there and I'm going to see how you and your wife or see you know, what you do with your wife. He didn't exactly tell him that. Yeah. You know, he just he's just going. He's just going where he, you know, thought where he needed to go. And so, OK, this I know I'm getting ready to go through the hood. I mean, look, look, and I hop in the car. If I know I got to go through the hood, you know, I know I know where all my. I know where my weapon is. I know where all my ammunition is at. You know, if I'm going to be down there for a minute, I, I'm thinking ahead. That's not lack of faith. That's just good judgment, right? right. Why the circuit harmless is that? That's right. That's right. I know where everything's at. Like I gotta tell, tell uh, you know, my wife and they, they like to go, you know, for, in Vegas, and you know how hot it is. They like to go for walks in the evening. Okay, and I tell them, because I don't usually go with them, I said, but you know, keep your head on a swivel, be paying attention to your surroundings and, and all that. Though I feel like the Lord has a hedge of protection around us, that don't mean you just blindly walk wherever you want to and don't pay no attention to people around you. You got to use some wisdom. But So here Abraham is trying to use some, some what he thinks is wisdom to get through this so he don't, you know, so the Egyptians don't kill him and take his wife. Verse 13, say... I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Uh -huh. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. And you, didn't, you know, notice here, uh, Sarah, Sarai here, she didn't, she didn't uh, chime up and say, well, you ain't even willing to fight for me. You know, she didn't give me no <laughs> static, right? <laughs> I just, I just want to point that out. You know, she, she's, she understood. She knew what, you know, what time it was, and she wanted to go along with her husband. Right. She didn't egg it on, you know, ah, you just don't care about me, and, you know, you're just trying to save yourself. Right. <laughs> anyway, verse 15. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the one was taken into Pharaoh's house. Mm -hmm. And he entreated Abraham well for her sake that he had sheep and oxen and asses. And men service and maid service, and she asses and camels. Mm -hmm. And Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Okay, so for, first of all, it's just go to show you just how beautiful Sarah must have been. Just on her beauty alone, Pharaoh's willing to give up all his, you know, give a, a, a great amount of livestock and 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 uh, riches to to Abraham. Just, just based upon her beauty. He don't even know nothing about her character or if she got a mouth and an attitude yet. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, you know, he, he might have regretted that because she could have had some kind of, you know, she, she could have paid him all kind of lip service. But he, he, he you know, he willing to give all these, all this stuff, all this substance. And then it says, and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Sarai, Abram's wife. So the Lord, in, the Lord has interjected in here. And now he, you see, this is, this is what you might say, that hedge of protection there. He's, he's going to protect Abraham and, his, and his, his wife, right? So you could, you know, playing armchair quarterback, 
Monday morning quarterback, you say, well, see, all Abraham had to do was just have faith in the Lord and the Lord was going to intercede and protect him. But he didn't know this. He didn't know. And we didn't know this until we read it. You know, we didn't know what the Lord's reaction was going to be. But Abraham, you know, he, again, he was using the best wisdom with the intelligence that he had, the best information that he had. And he was trying to move according. He didn't say he did, He wasn't trying to transgress the law at all. He's trying to maintain his integrity. He keep his character. But he was trying to move within the system the best he could. But here we see now the Lord, because Abraham was a good and obedient and faithful servant, the Lord is going to interject and put his hands on Pharaoh. He, so he's plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. Verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this thou hast done unto me? Mm -hmm. Why this thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Uh huh. Now, I don't know. Like we're going to read a, a, the, the occasion with Abimelech as well. So I don't know like Abimelech when Pharaoh or how Pharaoh found out that, it, that uh, Sarai was his wife. Because we don't read that the Lord told him. He figured it out some way. And he said, look, man, why you do this to me? Why did you tell me that she was your sister? Verse 19. Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, behold, thy wife. Take her and go thy way. Yeah, thank goodness, you know, take, take this woman and all these plays you done brought on my house and go away. Just get out of here. Go ahead. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all he had. That's right. So send him away. Get him, get you and your wife and take all this stuff and get out. <laughs> um, er, er, uh, um, let's see. Genesis 20. Genesis 20. And now, uh, verses, we're going verses 1 through 18. We're going to read the uh, instance with, with Abimelech. Same, same kind of circumstances here. Genesis 1 through 20. I mean, uh, one, Genesis 20, 1 through 18. All right, go ahead. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled in Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. Mm -hmm. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Mm -hmm. But God came to Abimelech in the dream by night and said, un said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, she is a man's wife. Okay. Now, something you might not, may or may not know, is that since the first incident with the Egyptians, or let me ask you this. How much time do you think has passed since the first, first incident with the Egyptians up to this incident with Abimelech? How much time do you think has passed? This is a rough guess. You would think it's, you wouldn't think it's a very long time. Ten years is a long time. You wouldn't think it's a very long time, right? Try, try 20 plus years. 20 plus years. This is this incident happens. Now, he knew what happens. You let you know, I mean, he, he, he's up there in age now. Maybe he forgot, you know, because I forget things. But maybe he forgot what happened with it with, with uh, Pharaoh. Right. So, you you know, when you've gone through a thing and especially if it would look like it was going bad, but then it works out for you, you know, you kind of remember, All right, I can't make them mistakes again. Right. All right. So let's we'll see if he changed. And say, you know, he learned from his first experience, right? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> right. <laughs> we have verse 4. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? And said he not, said he not unto me, she is my sister. Mm -hmm. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. All right. So now Abimelech, Abimelech, obviously, he knew the Lord. And he said this. He's, he's like, Lord, are you going to slay a righteous nation? You're going to slay a righteous nation for what, what Abraham has done. He, he told me it was his sister, not his wife. So you're going to slay a righteous nation for this? We got six? Yeah. Go ahead. And God said unto him in a dream. Yeah, 
I know that thou didst this in thine integrity of thine heart. Uh -huh. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Uh -huh. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. So he said, I know what was in your mind. He said, I know what you was thinking. He said, that's why I didn't let you, because you are a righteous nation, because you are trying to do right, I didn't let you touch her. You might have walked, you might have thought you was going down that road, but I didn't let you touch her. So this is this is that difference I was saying between what happened with what's going on over here with Abimelech and 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 uh, and the Pharaoh. I don't, I don't think the Pharaoh, I don't think the Lord told him. They, they, they matter of fact, they would look because we are. It looked like the Lord always wants to put a hand on Egypt because He already put plagues on them, and then Pharaoh figured it out. Oh, this must be the man's wife. Right. But the Lord didn't get at Abimelech like this. He didn't let he, he, he matter of fact, he kept him from doing any, any wrong here. So he didn't let her touch her. We have verse seven. Yeah. Go ahead. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. Uh huh. Again, we, we, we already read this, right? We already came through here, read mm -hmm. this for he is a prophet. Go ahead. And he shall pray for thee mm -hmm. and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that. Thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Mm -hmm. Therefore, so, okay, so again, that's what I was saying. I, I wonder, because he's because the Lord tells him, Look, I, I'm if you don't let her go, I'm going to sure you're going to surely die. And he said, All that are thine. Mm -hmm. And to see, that's the rage of a man right there. That's jealousy. I'm wondering if the Lord, if, if, if he's saying, If you don't give that man his wife back, he's going to kill you and everything you own. Huh. <laughs> so I, I, so I, said, I don't know. I don't know who's who here was going was threatening. Who's going to do the killing? But the Lord's letting him know you got to give her back. Verse eight. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. Mm -hmm. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I uh, have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me? And on my kingdom a great sin. Mm -hmm. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. Uh -huh. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? Go ahead. And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Mm -hmm. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Go ahead. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. Come on. And then I took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. Again, we see... The faith of Abraham, he maintained his integrity when he could have tripped out and he didn't. And the Lord blessed him for it. He comes out on the bigger end of this thing because he maintained his character, because he maintained his integrity. Go ahead. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases thee. And Sarah said, and unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other, thus she was reproved. Mm -hmm. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. Mm -hmm. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. That's right. So we see the Lord... The Lord interceded, and he interceded hard for his, for his servants, and he will do that for us. Obviously, you, Abraham will be a covering to their, to their eyes only because of you. Okay? Uh, now, okay, so we're talking about, well, so we see how Abraham kind of showed a little weakness there, or what could be perceived as a weakness. Again, I see, it, 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 it's, I think, Without the, the book actually saying, you kind of have to see it in your own way, whether it was cowardly like that article said, or, or whether it was a, a bit of wavering um, of his faith um, to go ahead and say it's his sister and not his wife. I mean, that's kind of, you know, however, however you want to see it, I can't really say it's in any, any, any one way is the right way. But it shows that 
it shows a little bit of weakness in him because he could have been bold about it and said, hey, you know, this is my wife. Come get her. if You think you can. But he didn't do that. All right. So let's go to uh, another wavering of faith, you might say. Genesis 16. And I say wavering because it's not a lack of faith. This doesn't show a lack of faith. I'm just going to say, you know, the water rippled a little bit. There was just a little bit of little bit of wavering here. Genesis 16, we're going verses one through four. Genesis 16 and we're going verses one through four. All right, go ahead. Now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing. Mm -hmm. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, that it may be that I may obtain children by her. Okay, so this incident, this what's going on right now, is 20... <clears throat> 25 to 29 years after Abraham, or the Lord told Abraham that he was going to have a son. It's 20, I think 25, it's 25 to 29 years since Abraham was told he was going to have this son. So it hasn't, so, so Abraham and Sarah haven't had Isaac yet, or haven't, they haven't even had their first child yet. And their faith is starting to waver a little bit, you might say, because it's been 29 years, 25 years, and what, you know, no, no child from the Lord, you're going to start to wonder. When you've had faith all this time, and then, and then something telling you, uh, or it's not going in the time frame that you think it should go, you might waver a little bit. You might come to wonder just a little bit what's going on. Now, her mistake here and Sarah's mistake here is thinking that she can help the hand of the Lord along. The Lord don't need our help. He said he was going to take care of it. She don't need to help it. So she come up with this idea. Well, let me let me send him to Hagar, my mistress, and she can have the child for us. That ain't what the Lord said. That wasn't the direction for the Lord, was it? That's not what he instructed. So we can't we got to understand we can't always. We can't always understand the plan of the Lord, but we just have to have faith in his plan. Let him do his work. We don't have to help him along. We don't have to help him along. So she sent Abraham in there and Abraham hearkened to his wife. Now, there might be a, that's that's a valid weakness, right? Listening to your wife. <laughs> so <fine>. God, <laughs> don't don't stone me. <laughs> I mean, it got Adam in trouble. He shouldn't hearken his wife. <laughs> Gone, he gone in there and, and gets in there with uh, Hagar. He, and uh, of course, whenever you know in, in the Bible, whenever you know somebody, a child comes next. <laughs> almost, almost, it seems like immediately. Yeah. But we got verse uh, uh, in the two. Okay, and go Abraham ahead. hearkened unto the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian, mm -hmm. after Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Uh huh. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Right, so now Sarah, just after Sarah's suggestion of this, you know, it, so she get, go ahead, you know, it happens the way she planned it, and then she want to turn around and get mad. She want to turn around and get mad about it. And that's also, uh, and, and it's also a little bit of the weakness on, uh, Abraham's part because he didn't control this. You know, he didn't control it because he allowed Sarah to be mad at her. She ends up putting her out of the house. And Abraham, you know, he if he was if he was ex, um, extolling the character that he really truly had and not wavering a little bit, he would have had complete control over this situation. You know, he would have told Sarah, you know, you chill out because you caused it. You brought this on. Now chill. Don't you know. But he did, like I said, he's, he's human. He shows a human character, a human side to Abraham, just like all of us would have had. And he wavered a little bit. All right. Um, skip down to 
Let me see. That was at, you was at four, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, keep reading, reading to verse six. Okay. And Sarah said unto Abraham, my wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. When she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. Mm -hmm. But Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand to do to her as it pleaseth thee. Mm -hmm. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So a a Abraham, you know, when, when you have a wife that's on something, when she, when, she get, when she get on something and she don't want to get off of it, at some point she's like, all right, you know, just, just deal with it however you feel, that, you know, just, just handle it. I just don't want to hear about it no more. And this is the point where Abraham's at. Okay, Sarah, she's in your hand. And so Sarah ends up kicking Hagar and this child out. Abraham could have handled that better. He could have he mastered that situation. He could have controlled that. Uh, Genesis 21 in 19, Genesis 21, I'm sorry, in verse 9. And see, because, because he didn't master it in the beginning, he didn't take control of this situation in the beginning, it continues on. It's, it's something that's, you know, it's, it's one of those things, if you don't nip it in the bud, it's going to grow, right? Uh, Genesis 21, 9 through 14, go ahead. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham mocking. Mm -hmm. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Okay, so Isaac is born here. Isaac is already at this point, he's, he's at, at the very least five years old, okay? Which means that, um, which means that uh, Ishmael is... I think he's 10. I forget. So Ishmael, Ishmael is a little older than Isaac. Okay. So some time has is, 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 is pro progressed here. And, 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 and uh, Sarah is still having some issues. She's still having hard feelings about Hagar. Right. She's still pretty raw about her. And so she said, look, she said, this woman, you know, uh, Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. She thought she, she felt like Hagar's mocking uh, Sarah and Isaac, okay? Once they're cast out, verse 11. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. So Abraham's, this thing is real grievous because Abraham did love Ishmael. That was his firstborn son. Every man loves his firstborn son, but this thing is grievous to him. Go ahead. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. Mm -hmm. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall I see be called. Okay, so there's a plan. Obviously, the Lord has to weigh in on this because Abraham's grieving over this to the point where the Lord said, I better say something to him. He's probably getting ready to do something, either to Sarah or something. He'll you know, his heels and say no. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's, get, I better let the brother know because he's getting ready to do something. So the Lord has a plan in all this. He's saying, look, have faith. I got a plan. Okay? Listen to Sarah. Because what she's doing right now is moving according to the plan. Because I, I, my, my choice to make a great nation is with Isaac. It's not with Ishmael. Okay? Right. So that's why this is going on. This plan has to go, and it has to go according to what the Lord is. So this is why we have to understand and learn, even though things may not be going like we might like it. Because remember, he says Abraham is grieved over this. This situation is not, not, not pleasant to him at all, even a little bit. But he's got to maintain his integrity. He's got to keep his character about him. And he's got to get through this and have faith. He's got to get, have faith that what is going on is of the Lord and it's going to turn out for the better. It's going to turn out to be all right. Go ahead. And also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. Mm -hmm. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away uh -huh. and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. So even though Abraham didn't really want to do this, he still maintained his integrity. He did the right thing, didn't he? 
Make sure she didn't go out there with no water, no bread, you know, make sure that she was going to be all right. He did the right thing, even though it wasn't the most ideal situation or the, how he would have wanted it to go. He maintained his integrity. He did what he, he trusted in the Lord and he did what he thought was right and he handled it the right way. All right. Genesis 21, and that's, a, that's where we're at, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's see. We're going to skip down to verse 22. Skip down to verse 22. Now, what I want to look at here is I want to show that because of, remember how I said, you know, in, in, in uh, me personally, I want people around me to realize that I'm a man of God without me having to tell them, Right? Abraham, because the way he moved, the people around him were able to see his integrity. They were able to see his character. Uh, go, so go ahead and read verse 22, and we can see the respect that he had outside of his household. Go ahead. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Pichol, the chief captain of the host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. So they were able to recognize, look, okay, God is with Abraham in everything he does. There, God is with Abraham in all that he does. Go into chapter 23 and verse 6. Right into chapter 23 and verse 6. Again, this is the, the perception of Abraham outside of his household. Those that don't know him, those that are on the outside looking in. Go ahead. Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. Hear us, O Lord, thou art, he's talking to Abraham, thou, you are a mighty prince among us. Giving Abraham proper respect. You know, we see you are a mighty Lord among us. Go ahead. And the choice of our supplicants bury thy dead. Mm -hmm. None of us shall withhold from thee his supplicator, but, thou, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. Right, okay. And Abraham that's stood. good, no, that's good. All right, so... Um, Let's go to jump back to chapter 13. Let me see. You said 13? Yeah, chapter 13. And I want to show here chapter 13 at verse 5. So what I want to show here is Abraham, one part of his character as, uh, and, and, and him being an intercessor, one of the things that he tried to do was whenever there was a, an issue, he tried to resolve that issue amicably, where everybody, uh, everybody comes out in the end. You know, he's not trying to take advantage of nobody. He's not necessarily trying to be the one to come out on the better half of this, uh, of the, uh, the disagreement or whatever. He wants everybody to be satisfied in this. Okay. So he's, he's doing, he's doing all he can to resolve disputes amicably. Genesis 13 and verse five. Go ahead. And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Mm -hmm. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. Mm -hmm. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's, Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. Uh -huh. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. Mm -hmm. For we be brethren. Right. So Abraham recognized, okay, I see this, you know, there's a problem here. I, I see that, you know, because your herd is getting big and my herd is big and your boys, uh, you know, are starting to beef with my boys. So we can't have this. We're brethren. We shouldn't be at each other's throats. Let's try to solve this problem so that we can remain brethren and not become enemies over, you know, material things, really. But go ahead. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. Mm -hmm. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Uh -huh. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And you notice what he did there. He put the choice in, in, in Lot's hand. He didn't say, I'm going to take this land over here because I perceive it to be the better land, you know, or the better deal. He said, I'm going to let, let Lot choose. 
whichever he thinks is suitable to him, then that, you know, that'll be the best way to solve this problem. It's not always about us. It, you know, it's what can we do for our brother? Go ahead. And Lot lift up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zoar, unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from another. Mm -hmm. Aaron dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Good. That's good. Okay, so we see he, he resolved that situation peaceably, didn't he? It didn't have to come to blows. They didn't have to hate each other. It didn't, none of that had to happen. He found a way to resolve this situation peaceably. Uh, skip down or go back into chapter 21. Back into chapter 21. And this time we're going to pick it up at verse 25. Chapter 21 and verse 25. And we're going to see another dispute where Abraham really could have got off on, on this, on Abimelech. He could have, he could have got off on him uh, because of what happened here, but he didn't. All right, 21, 25, go ahead. And then I said, I want not who have 20, done this 25? Oh, 26, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servant had violently taken him away. Okay, so Abraham, we read early, early on where, uh, they were the where he had gotten this will and they you know, they're like, you know, you can take all this. You have a plot yet. You also you have a place to bury your dead. We, you know, we ain't going to give. But anyway, he's got this well and Abimelech's people. Apparently, they violently took it away from Abraham. They took it by force. Right. So Abimelech. Uh, so Abraham, he could have he could have said, man, your people took my well and I come to get my pound of flesh for that. You know, he could have went off on him. But he just mentioned it here. He said, look, he's he, he telling them what happened. Verse tw uh, 27, right? No. 26. 26, yeah. And Abimelech said, I want not who, who hath done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it, but today. Right, so Abraham, so Abimelech is telling Abraham, he said, look, I don't know who did this. He said, I don't know nothing about it, and I hadn't even heard about it till you just told me today, till you told me this very day. Go ahead, verse 27. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. Okay, so you see, Abraham diffused this situation. He's, oh, I mean, his, Abimelech's people took this well, and he could have, he could have by rights, within his rights, demanded it back. Or demanded some property. But that's not how Abraham handled it, is it? He, he goes and gets substance, some of his substance, to diffuse the situation. Because Abraham really, even though he, you know, this, this, this well is a subject or a point of contention between him and Abimelech. Abimelech wasn't even aware of it. it obviously, it was going through Abraham's mind. So he wanted, he wanted, he wanted to resolve this, this dispute in his mind. Because there's obviously it was going through his head. Uh, I got I got a problem with you. You may not be aware of aware of it, but I'm going to fix it. OK, so how does he fix it? He doesn't demand property or his pr property back. What he does is he says, I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a uh, uh, like a trespass offering, a peace offering. So he goes and gets these sheep. Where you at? Twenty eight. Twenty eight. Go ahead. Um, and Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Mm -hmm. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? Now he's, Abimelech, is, he's, he, is, he is baffled. You just told me that my people took your well and you're going to bring these things. What, what, is, what, is this, what do these seven ewe lambs mean? What's this, what's this mean? Go ahead. And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Mm -hmm. Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because there they had swear, both of them. Uh -huh. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up and 
Ficho, the chief captain of his host, and they return into the land of the Philistines. Okay, so Abraham, again, like I said, he could have demanded this well, but he, instead he said, you know what? Okay, you weren't aware of what happened here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, he, and essentially he paid for this well twice. He paid him again. And it's all go well. This is how he, he was able to diffuse the situation. I know you... I, I, even though I know you should know I gave you money for this once already and they took it away from me, but here I'm going to pay you for it again. I'm going to defuse this situation. All right, uh, let's keep going. Uh, jump into chapter 24. One verse here, verse 35. This is an example that uh, Abraham's, his wealth, was a source of prestige. 24 and 25, right? No, yeah, 35, 35. 24 and verse 35, go ahead. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, mm -hmm. and he has become great, and hath given him flocks, and herds, and silver, and gold, and men servants, and maid servants, and camels, and asses. Right, so this is, uh, so, so what's going on here, uh, Abraham's man is out there trying to find Isaac a wife, and he's and, and Isaac and this man is telling Abra, uh, telling uh, about his master Abraham, and he said, "Look, you know my master is well off. You know the Lord's blessed him, and he's got all this wealth. So he's showing that this his this wealth was a source of prestige." Um, Genesis twenty four and one verse one jump back to verse 1. Go ahead. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Again, the Lord has blessed him in all things. Not just some things, but all things that he did. And this, and this blessing, this is, this, and like, if I know, like I, I know Brother Simeon is, is uh, you know, everything he does turn to, turn, turn to gold, and he is walking with the Lord. I'm looking at this like, man, the Lord is blessing this brother. The Lord is really, that's, that's a sign of prestige to me. That's The Lord is really walking with this man. All right. Um, Genesis 14, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Genesis 14, pick it up at verse 13. We're going 13 through 21. And what I'm showing here is that, you know, from people looking on the outside, they can see Abraham's prestige. You can also see that he was honored. Abraham was honored for his military prowess. He's honored for his military mind, his thinking, his ability to think ahead, his ability to strategize, his ability to plan, carry out that plan and succeed at that. These are characteristics, things we need, you know, that we should apply to ourselves, being able to think ahead, being able to plan, um, you know, for bad times as well as good times. Go ahead. Verse 13. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother Ishtar, of Ishtar and brother of Anur. And these were confederate with Abram. Mm -hmm. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed and trained servants born in his own house. 318 and pursued them unto Dan. So he had, so, so once he uh, under, uh, heard that Lot had been taken, what he do? He said he, he heard this, his brother was taken captive. He armed and he trained his servants. He armed and trained them. Born in his own house, 318 and pursued them unto Dan. Go ahead, verse 15. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah which is on the left hand of Damascus. So he's showing, he's showing uh, Abraham's strategy here. He divided up his troops, attacked them from both sides, and they <laughs> smote them all night. 
Go ahead, verse 16. And he bought back all the goods and also bought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Right, go ahead, verse 17. So he accomplished his goal. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveth, which is the king's dale. Mm -hmm. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Mm -hmm. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Uh -huh. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So, so the Lord, so, so the king of Salem is recognizing Abraham that the Lord is with him and that the Lord has, de has delivered his enemies into his hand. And, and Abraham, what did Abraham do? He gave him tithes. He gave the glory to God and gave tithes of all that he had. Verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. So the Lord, the Lord wants you give me the persons you just, and I'll take and you can keep all the stuff yourself. So uh, again, we see the honor, the Lord being or Abraham being honored for his military prowess. Um, we're, we're staying right here, but the next thing I want to show was that Abraham, uh, let me see. I think we can skip that. Uh, let's go into chapter 23. Chapter 23, pick it up at verse 7. Ready? So Abraham, Again, showing concern and, and care for his brother and what he's going to do. He's, what I'm showing here is he's showing that uh, he wants to he's maintaining his independence from the Canaanites and maintaining his integrity because he the Canaanites, they're not, you know, living for the Lord, weren't doing what they what they should have been doing. So Abraham is separating himself. You know, uh, he's sanctifying himself for, you know, for a better term, uh, 23 and verse 7. Go ahead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. Mm -hmm. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me to Hephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for possession of a bearing place amongst you. Mm -hmm. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heath, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heath, even all that went in at the gate of the city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me, the field give I thee, and the cave that is in, therein, I give it thee in the presence of the sons of my people, give I it thee, bury thy dead. Mm -hmm. And Abram bowed down himself before the people of the land, and he spake unto Aphron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field, take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Aaron, saying unto him, my Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heath, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Mashpelah. That's good. I, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so... 
I just wanted to 16, but I want to show there's Abraham maintain his integrity. And there was a little bit of a back and forth, back and forth, you might say. And, you know, he 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 showed, you know, he showed himself to be a man of God, even in the eyes of these Canaanites who he's having this back and forth with. All right. Let's keep going. Um, let's see. Um, I think I had just one more spot here. Oh, yeah. Uh, Genesis 18. And this is the last place. Genesis 18. And I want 1 through 8. 1 through 8. And what I want to show here is Abraham's showing hospitality to strangers. Okay? His and that's it's 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 not always like we we it's not hard for me to show love to my brother Simeon. He's my brother. But to to someone strange outside the gate, outside the circle, we also have to show love and hospitality to. And Abraham, here's an example. Abraham did that. Uh, 18 and verse 1. Go ahead. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Mm -hmm. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when they saw him, he ran when he to, saw them, when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground uh -huh. and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Mm -hmm. Let but, a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Mm -hmm. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that, ye shall pass on. Therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. Uh -huh. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal needed and make cakes upon the hearth. Mm -hmm. And Abraham ran into the herd, unto the herd and fetched the calf tender and good and gave it unto the young man and he hastened to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. All right. So we see here Abraham. You know, you know, he's he's he sees these guys going through, going through, and passing by. And what's he do? He opens up his home. He opens up his, you know, his uh, refrigerator. Well, he never refrigerated, but you see what I'm saying. He opened <laughs> up his 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 food stores to them and fed them and showed that hospitality. That I hope that we all as Christians are willing and able to do and if you, you come to my house I'm gonna feed you you know you know nobody's gonna leave there hungry if you need a place to stay I'll you know I'll make sure you got a place to stay that's just the way it is but that's that's having integrity and the character of Abraham may the Lord add a blessing to the reading hearing and doing his word and I hope you got some understanding in Jesus name Well, he's looking for the announcements. As always, it's a pleasure. I thank you all for having me. And uh, I always look forward. It's, a, it's always a good time coming here. I always love fellowshipping with you guys. It feels good to be back. Okay. Yeah, pretty good to have uh, Brother Simeon back, get through his trials and his tribulations and temptations. And obviously he maintained his integrity <laughs> through it all. <laughs> I know it could it, it can be tough without your car, man. Yeah. Yeah, the horse. <laughs> Sabbath announcements. We welcome you and hope today's lesson increase your knowledge 
of the Holy Bible. We have questions and answers every Wednesday at 5 p.m. via telephone conference line. The number and access code are located at the top of the lesson or see the live stream of questions and answers at www.kingdomcom.com, kingdomcom7.com. If you are interested in being baptized, please place your name on the list at the literature table. Remember to follow the dress code when attending our services. Men should remove all hats and all head coverings during service times. Women should wear a head covering such as a hat or a scarf during the service. Women should not wear tight fitting pants or skirts or revealing clothing. Attire should be modest according to the Bible. If your child becomes restless during the Bible lesson, we encourage you to remove your child from the room until he or she has settled. Your tithe and offerings are always appreciated. Please place your tithes and offerings in the offering envelope at the deposit in the offering box. Your cooperation is greatly appreciated. Again, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you next Sabbath. Peace. Peace. All right. All right, so if there is no other announcements, I guess we'll go ahead and stand face Jerusalem and have a uh, short break. Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. For he is good. For he is good. For his mercy endures forever. For his mercy endures forever. The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. The King of Kings. The King of Kings. The Mighty One of Jacob. The Mighty One of Jacob. And the Holy One of Israel. And the Holy One of Israel. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.